So what we do is dealing with uh, strokes, brain aneurysms. The, these are not situations where um, uh, we can wait for treatment. We have this motto called time is brain. Uh, and that means that, um, you know, if we are, if we delay care, more brain cells will die. So you'll see us uh, really rush uh, in the setting of an emergency. Uh, everything is done in a very expedited way. Uh, and um, we're trying to preserve as much of the brain, as many brain cells as possible. I start my day in the hospital by going over the patients that we're going to do surgery on today and then also discussing the inpatients that are folks that we've operated on and they are in the hospital. Hello. Hello. How you doing? Okay. So the first one on the list is uh, Quote on Air from Overnight, JM. He uh -huh. came in because he had some chest pain. His AICD was firing. Um, he also has a history of AFib on Zeralto. While he was here, um, he developed like a, a brief episode of altered mental status. And I'll take a look if we can address both aneurysms okay. and do stereotactic radio surgery. So, so the way we are able to look into the brain is uh, through radiation. So we take an X-ray and uh, X-ray allows us to visualize together with contrast to visualize blood vessels of the head and the brain uh, and of the neck. Um, uh, in great detail and we're, a we're able to get 3D renderings of those blood vessels and uh, that allows us to really understand and map out uh, our interventions and we're able to fix of course brain aneurysm, strokes, things of that nature. Once, once you're in the zone and you're doing the case, you're doing the case, right? You, you find your flow state and you are able to execute uh, at the best of your abilities and at the best of your training uh, every single time. The only difference is that in, a, in an elective case, there's a lot more thinking before the procedure uh, mm -hmm. and a lot more planning uh, mentally. Uh, and when it comes to an emergent case, uh, care is more protocolized. And so, you know, I like to say, you know, in emergencies, don't think. And I've said that before, don't think doesn't mean do things willy-nilly, but it, it does mean follow protocols, follow protocolized care. Uh, and uh, in emergencies you have to heavily rely on your skill and your training because there's not a lot of opportunity to analyze or think. So our program uh, doesn't have any residents and fellows in neurosurgery, neurointervention, or neuro-ICU and uh, that's that's a bit of a of a different approach to treating these patients. A lot of the places that do do uh, neurointervention, they have house staff that are being trained. The difference with us is that we have advanced practice providers. So advanced practice providers are nurse practitioners and physician assistants. And what they do is, um, you know, of course, you spend a substantial amount of time training them on how to take care of these patients. Once they're trained, they're spectacular. Uh, and so they're able to see consults, talk to families, help you in the operating room, uh, do minor procedures such as putting a, a sheath in, which is the special line that we place in somebody's groin or wrist to get access to their arteries so that we can go into the brain. They can put in external ventricular drains, which are uh, drains that we place inside somebody's brain to relieve the pressure when there is a ruptured brain aneurysm. Uh, and so they're, they're extremely versatile and extremely helpful and that allows us to multitask and do different things while having somebody that you rely on that can take care of the most challenging issues with the patient. Hey, how how's Bedouin doing? Bedouin's doing all right. They're doing better than yesterday. See, can we uh, check her labs today? Sure, let's go into the labs. Here's the chemistry. Yeah, she's a little hyponatremic. Um, we'll talk to the guys about Giving her, giving her some three percent. I think we're doing two feeds on her. Let's see, Brianna's a little elevated. Um, I think you know we stopped the IV fluids because her uh, pulmonary status was kind of uh, tenuous, but uh, we probably have to restart them because I think her kidneys are taking a bit of a hit uh, from that. Let's check her. Uh, let's check her hematology. Right, okay. right, right. Um, her H and H. Yeah, hemoglobin's a little low. Did we transfuse her recently? We transfused her yesterday with one pack of red blood cells. Okay, good. Yeah, she's still she's still not 
not horrible today, so we can we can hold off on doing something. Else. Yeah. So so working in the neuro ICU is uh, part of our day. You know, obviously being a neuro interventionalist is the component of my life where I work in the angio suite. But being a neuro intensivist is when I take care of these patients outside of the operating room. And obviously, caring for the patients is not just surgery, it's not just procedures. You want to make sure that you get them to recovery and you get them to uh, um, kind of to the next step of their, uh, of their journey in the most smooth way. And of course, a lot of our patients are critically ill, so they have to go to the intensive care unit. Some of them have breathing tubes, some of them uh, have uh, severe neurologic compromise, they need frequent monitoring. So they end up upstairs uh, in the neuro ICU with our nurses. Uh, who care for them 24-7 uh, in our neuro ICU team. I often round in that unit as an intensivist, uh, but we have a great group of folks up there that also do it. Dr. Ahmad, my partner, is up there and, and he works uh, constantly uh, with those folks. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's very rewarding to see how these patients do after we do the procedures and how we're able to get them through some really tough times, monitor them, make sure they don't need any additional procedures, and see them improve and eventually leave the hospital, go to rehab, and of course the next step is to see them in the office, which is equally rewarding than to see how they're outside of the hospital and back into normal life. You know, after we do our morning cases, sometimes I have to go to the office to see patients. See a lot of patients in the office. Some of them are folks that we've operated on. Some of them are new patients that might need surgery or might need monitoring. So you need to be able to switch gears from the clinical operative uh, end where, you know, uh, you worry about major complications and about getting somebody uh, healthy through an intervention all the way to you know talking to somebody in the office in a relaxed setting and telling them about uh, their day and discussing their pathology and everything else so it's uh, it definitely provides variety but it's a it's a really interesting uh, it's a really interesting day well, the, that initial interaction with a patient will uh, uh, create the foundation for what's going to happen down the line and that initial interaction is, is what's going to build that relationship between a physician and a patient that's uh, probably the most important thing when it comes to getting through a disease. You know, because folks, you know, po po a significant part of the healing process is uh, uh, emotion and, and, uh, and how people think about their disease. And so uh, building that trust with a physician that hopefully is unbreakable and can can get them through some really challenging times you know they they put they really put their lives in our hands uh, you know they they uh, allow us to operate on their brain uh, they're at their most vulnerable state so uh, we need to of course treat them with respect and understanding and uh, also understand how they feel and how stressed they are uh, in that setting and so having a good bedside manner really um, really makes a substantial difference in, in how the patients eventually do with their disease. Hey, good bud. You have to be very direct and you have to communicate extremely fast. So obviously, this is not something that most people have thought about. Most family members have not thought about the situation where their mother, father, aunt, uncle is having a stroke. So, of course, um, they're faced with the reality of the problem. They're dealing with the emotional burden that comes from that. But at the same time, they have to make some medical decisions and they have to be put on the spot. And it's a very tough um, uh, interaction to, to coordinate. And of course, over time, we as interventionalists become proficient at being able to handle those situations, right? And, you know, you often have to be able to communicate compassion and care, but also um, your intention to move fast. And, of course, you always explain to the family that we have to move fast. You know, it's not, we're not rushing anybody, but it's to the best interest of their loved one to move as, as quickly as possible and get, and get the job done. And so, 
you know, we go straight to the point in these conversations. We explain to them what the problem is. We explain that there's a blockage in the large blood vessel in the brain, especially when it comes to stroke. Uh, and um, once um, we, we have to open that blood vessel to allow the blood to flow again into the brain and, and allow the brain to recover. Uh, and that's a time sensitive procedure. We explain how we do it, that we do it through the groin. And uh, when um, we explain the risks, uh, we're very specific about the risks and also explain the alternative, which is if we don't do an intervention, most likely the brain will die, most likely the patient will have a devastating deficit in these situations or potentially lose their life. Uh, and uh, then we go forward with the procedure, of course, after they give their consent. They speak to us, they speak to the anesthesiologist sometimes. If the consent is over the phone, they have to speak to a few witnesses. But, um, you know, I, make, I, I try to answer any questions they might have before asking the questions, right? I try to anticipate. Over time, I've come to know and understand what people typically ask because, again, you want to be as, as uh, methodical and as, as uh, direct as possible to be able to get to the procedure quickly and open the blood flow to somebody's brain. You know, my patients always can reach me. They uh, call the service phone that then obviously calls me, finds me anytime, day or night. Um, you know, it's part of the job. You have to deal with it um, when they call. And I would say, frankly, you know, for the amount of patients we see, we don't get uh, too many phone calls after hours. Uh, and when somebody calls, there really is a significant issue. Uh, but in any event, you know, this, this, this happens all the time, of course. And on top of that, you have emergencies from, you know, emergency room calls or consults. Um, and that kind of gets superimposed on your regular day, um, you know, when you're seeing folks in the office or while, while you're doing surgery. You have to be able to multitask and, and give everything your full attention. And I think the most important quality is the ability to prioritize. Being able to prioritize, being able to multitask, I think are the two most important components of, of being able to do this successfully. You know, like I said before, there's definitely lows when it comes to devastating um, devastating disease and devastating injuries that folks cannot recover from but the highs are so substantial that um, we keep going and we we enjoy what we do but you know there's nothing more rewarding than um, removing a clot say from somebody's brain um, and you know three seconds before you're able to do that they cannot move one side of the body they cannot talk and the second you take the clot out they're able to shake your hand with a hand that wasn't moving before uh, and, and so that, that is really uh, what motivates us. This is really what gets us up at two in the morning. And I think the whole team is very excited and privileged to be able to offer those services.